The story I'm about to tell you is a fairy story. It's got genuine fairies in it. And it's about how humans get catapulted into adventure through breaking a fairy law. Ah, uh, yes, the difference is that in fairy tales, the humans don't always know what law they're breaking or why. I should have known better. <laughs> I did know better. I grew up with the folk. They stole me when I was just a few weeks old. They left one of their own in my bassinet for my parents to raise. So I'm kind of, oh, well, bicultural, <laughs> human and fairy. A changeling, in fact. My story takes place in New York City. Not the one in the I Heart New York posters, no. <laughs> but the one that exists beside it. In the walls and crawl spaces and all the little pockets and passages of its infrastructure. Call it uh, New York Between. That's what I call it. The folk don't call it anything. They simply live there. Me, they call Neef. <laughs> Which was okay when I was a kid, but I'm not a kid anymore. I wish they'd pick something, you know, a little less lame. Eh. So anyway, once upon a time, not all that long ago, I was sitting in the folk exchange with Snowbell and Fleet. We were talking about men. Actually, Fleet, who'd just been dumped by the selkie she'd been dating, was talking about men, and Snowbell and I were listening. Snowbell is a swan maiden, you know. Fleet's a changeling, like me. The folk exchange is a, a kind of open place. Sometimes you even see vampires there. <laughs> anyway, here we are, drinking nectar, eating fairy cakes, and listening to Fleet carry on about her selkie. Her ex, Selkie, sorry. We'd been having this fight, Fleet was saying, and about how I didn't understand the stresses of being a shape changer and all, and I just said if he wanted me to understand so bad, maybe he should lend me his seal skin, and he just... Snowbell made a noise that was a lot more swan than maiden. Fleet shook her black braids forward over the cinnamon oval of her face. It was all his fault. He started. He was all, you're just human. You don't know what it's like. You haven't got any magic. And well, I kind of lost it, I guess. You can say that again. How could he be so dumb? Fleet sighed. Yeah, love, I guess. It makes you do stupid things. Oh, love. <laughs> like you know anything about love, I said. I know more about it than you do, Fleet countered. I've had lots of boyfriends. When was your last date? Hmm? Well, you know, she had me there. Having a love life is hard for a changeling. <laughs> there aren't many folk a girl can date. A lot of them are as ugly as a backup sewer and would rather take you apart than out dancing. The beautiful ones, huh? yeah, the beautiful ones, they know how to have fun, don't they? But they can be kind of temperamental. And changelings don't date changelings, no. We hang out together, we talk things over, we're friends, but oh, we don't date. I mean, who'd go out with a human being when there are elves around? <laughs> Snowbell stretched out her long white neck and gave her slender shoulders a, a swanny little ripple. You will stop quarreling, she said. It's not interesting. Neither of you knows anything about love. You both are human. You are too frail to bear the intensity of true love. If you felt for one moment the heat of, de of desire the least of the folk feels, you would turn black and crumble like toast, both of you. Oh, dog do, I said. Please stop sniveling. You know, I've heard that line before there, Snowbell, and to be perfectly honest, I've never seen the slightest proof of it. It looks to me like we humans are the ones who do all the loving around here. All you guys do is eat it up with a spoon. Now, Snowbell, as I said, is a swan, and she isn't very big. She's all white skin and floaty hair and big black eyes, wistful and delicate as a paper flower. But she's got a touchy temper and a mean bite. I thought for a minute she was going to go for me, but she laughed instead. I have an idea, she said. You will try to prove that humans know more of love than the folk. Yes, that's it. That's it. You, Neef, will try to prove that humans know more of love than the folk. Why? I asked. Because, Neef, you will discover that I am right, and I look forward to watching you lose. And what happens if I do? The usual, I think. Uh... Service for a year and a day. It's been ages since I had a human servant. <laughs> and if I win? You won't win. <laughs> but I'll give you a boon if you do. Whatever you like. We'll put it to the genius of Central Park at the Solstice Rave. Snowbell got to her feet in a graceful surge and preened her tight black hair. Good luck. 
Before I could tell her that she could do with her dumb bet, uh, she was out the door. Oh, you're in deep trouble now, girlfriend, Fleet said. Oh, not even. All I have to do is avoid her for a while and she'll forget all about it. I never said I accepted or anything. Hm. Fleet just gave me a look. Come on, girl. Who may you, you make the rules around here? I don't think so. If you say you're not playing, she'll just collect anyway. <laughs> and you know it. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. Oh, you gotta help me, Fleet. What am I going to do? Fleet thought thoughtful. Well, I guess you could go ask the genius of the New York Public Library. He knows everything, they say. <gasps> oh, good idea. Thanks, Fleet. You're a peach. And I walked out of the folk exchange and I took the betweens ways to the New York Public Library to ask the genius about love. The proper team term is a genius loci, the guardian of the place. <clears throat> there are a bunch of them, and they're the most New York of all New York folk. A building or a park or even a street is around long enough with people loving it and thinking it's important, and a genius appears, poof, like magic. The genius of the New York Public Library is not as old as the genius of Broadway, no, or as powerful as the genius of Central Park, no. No, but the genius of the New York Public Library, well, he's pretty impressive anyway. The genius of the NYPL speaks every language he's got a book written in. He knows everything that's in the library, from agriculture to zoology. He can and will go on endlessly about any subject. He's kind of cute, in a lanky, long-haired, short-sighted way, and he rustles pleasantly when he moves. Love, he said thoughtfully. Hmm, a rich subject, isn't it? A thorny subject. May I inquire why you're choosing to research it here? Well, I've got this bet with a swan maiden, I said. I have to prove that humans know more about love than the folk do. Hmm. But how do you propose to go about winning this, uh, bet? <laughs> I don't really know, I confessed. I thought I'd ask you to help me. He took off his huge square spectacles and polished them with a white handkerchief. Premise, he said dryly. I am no expert on the subject of human love, being myself a supernatural being. Hmm? Secondus, I am not a pedagogue. I am simply a repository of admittedly human knowledge and opinion. In short, I do not answer questions. My books do. Oh. Well, this was going to be more complicated than I'd hoped. Well, then, I guess I'll read a few books about it. The genius replaced his glasses. Reading is good. Histories make men wise, poets witty, the mathematics subtle, natural philosophy deep, moral, grave, logic and rhetoric able to contend. He fixed me with his bright expectant look like a pigeon waiting for a crumb. I nodded like I knew what he was talking about, but you can't fool a genius. Oh, I was quoting Francis Bacon, child, from the essay On Studies. I recommend it. On Studies? Bacon? Uh, does it have anything to do with love? He turned back to his desk. Hmm. In a matter of speaking, no. The New York Public Library is open to everyone, but you will need a card, and you'll need to peruse this list of rules. The rules are very important. He opened one of the quadrillion drawers in his huge desk. He pulled out a small cardboard rectangle, a sheet of paper, which he handed to me before dipping a long feather pen into an ornate inkwell. Name... He did not mean my real name, of course. There's a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy on names in New York between where names are, where names are power. Neef, I told him. N-E-E-F, Neef. And I started to read. Regulations for the use of the New York Public Library between Department of Humanities and Social Services. Do not deface or write in a book. Do not bring food or drink of any kind into the library. Do not remove any book from the library. Do not create a disturbance. Do not enter the stacks. Um, sir, I said, I don't quite understand rule number five. If I can't go into the stacks, uh, how am I supposed to get the books? He turned his spectacles on me. Why, you consult catnip, of course. One of the library pages will then get it for you. Have you never been in a library before, um, Neef? No. He smiled, showing small pointed teeth. Stay out of the stacks, child. They're dangerous. Now, <clears throat> I've lived in New York between all my life. 
I know a fairy law when I hear one. I put the rules in my pocket. I took my library card, which announced in beautiful spidery letting, lettering that one Neef was allowed unlimited reading privileges at the NYPL. Then the genius blew down a brass tube sticking out of the wall by his desk. A page popped out of another brass tube and unrolled itself at my feet. I moved back so I wouldn't step on it and greeted it. Don't bother, the genius said. It's deaf. Unrolled, the page came up to my waist. It looked like a giant paper doll with a, a smiley face inked onto its circular head. Don't tell me, it said. You're a changeling, and you want to get in touch with your human heritage. What can I get you? A nice romance, some pop psych, or maybe some more changeling? Hmm? Quantum physics, Sigmund Freud, yes? The genius glared at it. The page will take you to the reading room and introduce you to catnip. Goodbye. He turned back to his desk. The page was hard to see when it turned sideways, but I managed to follow it up and around and along the between ways of the NYPL. We ended up in a room with a handful of changelings in it, sitting in comfy chairs with their noses and open books. It was a nice room, just perfect for reading in, plenty of soft silver fairy light, little desks to write on if you needed to, and a happy hum of minds concentrating on stuff they weren't interested in. Cat nips in here, said the page. Come on. I followed into a side room, which was, well, furnished, if you can call it that. A couple of chairs and a lion on a marble pedestal. The lion's eyes were closed, its paws were stretched out in front of it. It was maybe the size of a big dog, and its fur was a grainy white. The page tickled the lion between its furry ears. It opened its eyes, which were robin's egg blue, and it stared up at us. This is catnip, the page told me. It knows what books we have and where they're kept. It's a simple user-friendly system designed for you to be able to figure out by yourself. Give it a little pat when you're done. That puts it back to sleep. And the page left me there, face to face with catnip, which yawned toothily. Okay, okay. I've dealt with enchanted animals before. You ask them questions, they answer. You just have to ask them <laughs> the right questions. If I only knew what the right questions were... Well, that's a place to start. What should I ask you? I said. The lion blinked at me. Title, author, subject, keyword. And this was not very clear, but then magic animals weren't supposed to be clear, are they? I thought for a while. Subject, I guess. Love. The lion shut its eyes and seemed to go to sleep again. I tickled it between its ears experimentally, which produced nothing more helpful than a slight irritated growl. I was about to go out and tackle the page when the lion opened its eyes again. There are 28,073 entries under love, it informed me. Okay, I said. How about romance? 13,298 entries, Catnip said. Would you like some search tips? Well, that was a little more user-friendly. I smiled into its eyes. Yes, please. Limit your search, Catnip suggested. Say what? Catnip sighed. Oh, love poems, divine love, love and women. Oh, thank you. It's hard to ask questions when you don't know what you're asking, you know. Catnip had no answer to that, unless you counted a twitch of its tufted tail. Okay, I said half to myself. What I want to find out is... You're never going to get anywhere like that, said a voice behind me. It was a nice voice, smooth and deep as a double chocolate ice cream. I turned around and saw it belong to a guy. Maybe a little older than me, brown eyes, brown hair, but built like an athlete. Almost too good looking to be human. He was dressed in the changeling uniform of jeans and t-shirts stolen from the Salvation Army bins, but didn't matter. <laughs> he looked like a prince in disguise, as a swine herd, or well, because this was 21st century New York and not 19th century Germany, like a rich boy pretending to be a street person. What are you staring at? Did I cut myself? This wasn't a question I felt like answering, so I turned back to the lion. It yawned and settled its chin on its paws. Hey, don't go to sleep on me here. I haven't found a book yet. Here, the changeling said. Let me help you. In one way, it was easier, hmm? since he knew how to ask the right questions. In another, it was just about the most embarrassing thing in the world to have to tell the cutest human guy I'd ever seen that I was searching for books about love. <sighs> Once I got it straightened out that I wasn't looking for the joy of sex, though, it, it got better. The way it worked was you gave catnip your subject, properly limited, and catnip gave you mice. 
asked Mice. They hopped right out of its mouth. It lined up on the pedestal and gave you their titles, authors, and publication information, one after the other, in tiny, clear little voices. The mice, the handsome changeling had pulled up for me, represented a couple of anthologies of love poetry, a couple of scientific-sounding studies, and something called Your Love Signs. Well, how many can I choose? I asked. And the pages will bring you two volumes at a time. I grabbed two mice at random. They snuggle cozily into my fingers. What if I want the others later? They'll come if you call them by title and author. Who designed this system anyway? The guy shrugged. Nobody designed it. It just, it just happened. Typical fairy magic, you know. Yeah, well, thanks for your help, guy. You're not home free yet. You have to get a page. I'm Byron, by the way. Oh, and I'm Neef. <laughs> I'm Neef. <laughs> I was also in love. I was ready to can my mice and my bet with Snowbill and ask him if he'd like to cut out for a nice long walk in Central Park. But he was already heading toward the back of the reading room, where there was a long wooden counter. It had a couple of books and scattering corn on it, and a small stack of pages. Byron peeled a page from the stack and skimmed it across the counter. The page shook itself with an ir irritable rustle, and chose a kernel of corn and gave it to me, took the mice, rolled itself tight around them, and dove into a brass tube. Byron breathed into my ear. That's your seat number. Okay now? I was anything but okay. His whisper had gone through me like an electrical charge. What? He tapped the colonel. I looked down. I noticed it had a number printed on it. Oh yeah, sure. <sighs> Thanks. He flashed me a heart-stopping smile, and he went off to his own seat, which wasn't, of course, anywhere near mine. I'm sure the page did it on purpose. Glamour is usually a folk thing. Mm. But Byron definitely had it. Not megawatt, like a fox spirit or a puka. His was more subtle, like a, a couple of candles on a bedside table. It was enough, though, to make me want to go up behind him, run my fingers through his hair, cross his shoulders, broad to square under his torn t-shirt. Oh... But that would lead to breaking rule number four, don't create a disturbance, and possibly rule number one, don't damage the books as well. <clears throat> so I didn't do anything. But thinking what I'd like to do, passed the time until the page brought me my books. Here you go, girly. Knock yourself out. And girly, you want to quit thinking so loud. You're making us blush here. I blushed myself. And then I picked up the top book and opened, opened it and started reading. Now, since this is a fairy tale, I'm not going to go on about what I learned at the NYPL. Fairy tales don't go into detail about what the characters do between adventures. I'll just say that those books, the poems especially, cast a spell of their own, a powerful enchantment that changed the way I felt about being human. I didn't always understand them, but I felt them curling up in my brain and making me feel stuff I'd never felt before. Poetry is like that. The poems were enchanting enough to make me forget about Byron. <laughs> Almost. I didn't sneak a peek at him more than every couple of pages or so, and when he closed his book and took it back to the book counter and put on a battered leather jacket to leave, I swear I got up and followed him just because I was hungry, yeah. He waited for me by the door. I sauntered up to him. Miss nonchalance of New York between, I was. This part of town's not of my flight path, I whispered. Where can I go and get a, grab a sandwich, hmm? Well, instead of answering, he took my hand and he pulled me with him out the door. I don't know how he felt when our hands clasped, hmm? When my mouth went dry, my face flamed as hot as a sidewalk in August. I checked my symptoms against the poems. <laughs> yep, love, for sure. Maybe this bet would be easier to win than I thought. We ended up at a place I'd never been before. The Wannabe, under Times Square. I think it's a place Frida probably knows about. It was a changeling hangout, no folk allowed. And it served human food, stolen from a deli outside. It smelled kind of odd to me, but I was willing to try anything Byron liked. He ordered the hamburgers and a coffee for both of us, and I tried to think of a, a conversation starter. After about forever, all I could come up with was, So, uh, <clears throat> what are you studying, hmm? Magic. Oh, uh, why? He looked around, scrooged his chair a little closer to me. I want to get out of here. I want to get back outside, where I belong. I nodded. Just my luck. I meet the answer to every changing girl's prayer, and he turns out to be a Looney Tunes. <laughs> Everybody knows changelings can't get out of New York between, not unless the folk kick them out. Most changelings wouldn't go outside if they could. I sure wouldn't. 
Go to a place without magic where you need money to live, where the wind will chill you and the rain wet you, and you can't talk to cats or dance with the veilies or match wits with a leprechaun, huh? Not on your life. Okay, yeah, I was curious about outside, sure. I read the newspapers and magazines that blew down the storm sewers and listened to the folk stories about their adventures with mortals. Mm, but no way did I want to live among mortals. Uh, they're too unpredictable. I'm like a pet, a toy, and I'm sick of it, Byron said. Nothing I do makes any difference here. I want to make a difference, Neef. I want to be somebody. I want to be a hero. Well, he might have been Looney Tunes, but he was definitely adorable. <sighs> I made sympathetic noises, and I watched his brown curls flop endearingly over his forehead whenever he pushed them back. There's got to be a way. I mean, you know the precedents. Thomas the Rhymer, Tamlin, Orpheus, Hercules. All I have to do is put it all together. I've got this theory, Neef, that it all has to do with chaos theory, alchemy. You see, a lot of... Well, while he talked, I admired how passion lit fires behind his soft brown eyes, and I wondered whether I could get him to look at me like that. Since I doubted he'd succeed in getting out of New York between, I figured I'd have plenty of time to try. Hmm. I never got back to the library that day. We stayed at the wannabe for... A while, and then we went dancing at the permanent floating uh, fairy rave. I couldn't quite figure out why Byron was sticking with me when there were so many delicious folk looking at him, but finally, ultimately, I didn't care. We had a good time. When we got tired of dancing, we swam with the merfolk in the New York Harbor, and we stole clams from the Grand Central Oyster Bar, and we caught an act of Song of Broadway, the folk's perpetual musical entertainment. We did stuff until we were too tired to do any more, and then we fell asleep. When I woke up, I was in... I was in a nest of werebears underneath the Central Park Zoo, and Byron was nowhere. The werebears didn't know where he had gone, but I did. When I walked into the reading room, there he was, curly brown head bent worshipfully over a huge book. They were at the zoo. That's where. Oh, werebears. I thought you were saying where are the bears. The bears were at the zoo. The werebears. Where were the werebears? Oh, but I digress. <clears throat> there he was at the reading room. Curly brown head bent worshipfully over a huge book with black covers and red angles and edges, and I made sure to pass his chair on my way to the catalog room, and I brushed his shoulders that went by. <laughs> he didn't even look up. Yeah, that was disappointment. But then I reminded myself that he wanted to be a hero. Yeah, fine. I understand heroes. They go on, in, on impossible quests. Byron was just doing his thing. I decided to play with catnip for a while, and then I decided if I could get him to come out to the wannabe and tell me how it was going. Catnip was asleep when I came in, its mane a furry wave over its glistening shoulders. I, I scratched it gently between its teacup-sized ears. Catnip's fur was soft and springy under my fingers, and it purred like an approaching subway. Hey there, Catnip, what's up? It opened its eyes, I shook its mane and yawned. Author, title, mm, subject, keyword. <sighs> okay. Okay, today I'm going to learn to talk to you. It was fun, really. At one point, I had the room full of mice nosing all over the floor while I tried to figure out how to organize my searches. Then I discovered stuff, how to, how to get a list of titles without the mice, and the subject index, and all kinds of cool stuff. Catnip was incredibly patient with me, and once I learned how to ask, he showed me all sorts of useful shortcuts. Finally, I buried my fingers in Catnip's mane. Mm, thanks. I said, you're the best, Catnip. Sleep tight now. I tousled the coarse fur and I watched the blue eyes drift shut. That was when I heard the uproar in the reading room. The first thing I thought was, there's rule number four down the tubes. And then I recognized Byron's voice, and I got my butt out there on the double. Byron was climbing over the counter. There wasn't a page in sight. The changing or milling around like a flock of worried pigeons cooing frantically. Oh, what's he doing? What's he doing? He's breaking all the rules. Come back, you idiot. Somebody call the genius. Oh. It took me about two breaths to take all this in, and then I was across the room and on top of the counter myself, which by the time Byron was standing in front of a door I hadn't seen before, a wooden door with a frosted glass window in it, narrow but human-sized. One hand was on the polished brass doorknob, and the other cradled a terrified mouse. He was flushed, determined, and totally, awesomely heroic-looking. <laughs> Byron, stop! I called. He glanced patiently over his shoulder, dead set on breaking rule number five, whatever the consequences. Just a sec, I'm coming with you. I was over the counter and through the door before I had time to think whether it was a good idea. 
I looked around for my dashing boyfriend, who had thoughtlessly dashed out of sight. I thought I heard his boots moving down a parallel aisle. I ran to intercept him, but when I reached the cross aisle, it was empty in both directions. Ah, so here I was, in the stacks, alone. I could go back. Huh. Yeah, but how lame would that be? The stacks stretched around me, dim and cramped. I could touch the ceiling without stretching, uh, without stretching, and the aisles between the cast iron shells were a lot wider than my shoulders. The air was cool and dry, not at all musty or dusty or book smelling. It didn't seem dangerous. Uh, no, although I, I did notice that the books were all jailed behind iron grills. Hmm. I concentrated on listening for the sound of footsteps or breathing, anything to tell me which way Byron had gone. And that's when I began to hear voices. The voices. It was real subtle at first, a vague, low murmuring that was so much a part of the atmosphere I might have been imagining it. But once I noticed it, it got louder. I started getting jittery. I mean, here I was in a forbidden place, a place I'd been warned against. And there were these mysterious voices getting louder by the second, like an invisible mob creeping up on me. I stood there undecided, getting antsier and unhappier while the murmuring grew. I started picking up words. Psyche, death, human condition, one of theirs, wrong. I put my hands over my ears. A mouse ran across my foot, which made me jump about a mile and duck into the shelter of one of the side aisles. The mouse scrambled up the grill that covered the shelf, wiggled through the wires, sat on a book spine. I shrank back to the end of the row and made, made like a bookcase just before a page appeared and opened the grill. The mouse disappeared to wherever magical constructs go when they're not needed, and the page wrapped itself around the book and dived into a brass tube at the mouth of the aisle. Well, one mystery solved. That's how they got the books out. Several million more mysteries to go. Hmm? <clears throat> Beginning with, where was Byron? How was I going to keep from going nuts? <laughs> no wonder pages were deaf. I wished, briefly, that I was too. And that's when I remembered that I'd already broken rule number one that day. Rule number two also, in fact, do not bring food or drink of any kind into the library. In my pocket was a corned beef and mustard on rye that I'd picked up at the wannabe. I fished it out of my pocket sweater, tearing off little pieces of fairly unmustardy crust, squished them up and stuck them in my ears. Gross, hmm, yes, but effective. The murmuring faded to a faint roar, like traffic through a closed window, easy to ignore for a city girl like me. Now I could think. Yes, and so I did. Think. Okay, it was a big library. Running around like an idiot was only going to tire me out, not to mention getting me more lost by the second... What I needed was a mouse. To get a mouse, I needed catnip, which was back in the reading room. Mm, dead end. So much for thinking. I crept out of my aisle. I looked right and left. To the right, the corridor disappeared around a bend. To the left, I saw a narrow stair leading to the next level. I turned left. The genius was right. The stacks were dangerous. The only way I can explain it is to say that those books really, really wanted to get my attention. When I didn't respond to their whispering, they sent out fictional characters, metaphors, and dangerous ideas to reel me in. I was pelted with visions, a path between a snowy wood and a frozen lake, a man who was also a tree with a woman twined ivy-like around him, a wild-haired woman with blood on her clothes, brandishing a knife and begging me with terrible eyes to listen to her story. Oh, <clears throat> I'm calm about it now. I survived it, after all. But I wasn't very calm then. I was scared shitless, okay? I knew it was all an illusion that the woman's knife couldn't cut me or the man and the woman break my heart with their beauty. Oh, but it felt as if they could. There in the stacks of the New York Public Library, I, I was terrified. I... Finally, I shut my eyes and crawled, the floor reassuringly cold and stable under my hands and knees until I got to the stairs. I crawled up a few steps. I cautiously opened my eyes. All I saw were dimly lit aisles and flat black ends of bookshelves. I'd reached neutral ground. Praise Lord. My face was sweating. I wiped it on my sleeve. And that's when I found the hair. My sweater was black, and the hair, which was white, showed up like a print against the dark wool. The werebears were brown. I don't have a cat of any color, so I must have picked it up in the catalog room just before the upheaval began. Well, I may not know much about human love, but I do know what to do with a hair from a magical animal. Carefully, I tweezed it up between my fingernails and I breathed on it. Catnip brave, catnip bold, please boot me up before I'm old. Flattering, my deep voice remarked at my shoulder, will get you everywhere. Although I must say I don't think much of the poem. 
It was catnip. <laughs> All right, bolt up right against the landing above me. What happened to title, author, subject, and keyword? I asked a little shakily. Catnip just looked as inscrutable as a cat can look. I can do that, if you like. No, that's okay. This is fine. Listen, Catnip, I need a mouse, big time. When you have me? Hmm. Catnip sounded offended. If you like, I can move through the stacks much faster than the mice. And there's really not a lot of time to spare, little one, if that's tiresome young hero you're looking for. I couldn't let myself think about what might be happening to Byron. I didn't have time to panic. You will? I mean... I never expected you'd, you'd help me yourself. Oh, huh. I appreciate that catnip, really. How much would you appreciate it? How much does this young human mean to you? No one curses in New York between unless they're prepared to deal with the consequences, but I, I came close. I hate unanswerable questions as much as, I, as much as I hate bargaining with magical animal when I'm in a hurry. But what choice did I have? Name your price. We'll see if I can meet it. You. Meaning, I will not bargain with you. I'm offering you my help, girl, in return for your service. That's the trade. Time grows short, changeling. Oh, boy. At this rate, I was going to be running errands for animal folk for the rest of my life. Okay, I said. Yes, I agree. You help me get Byron out of here. I'll scratch you behind your ears and bring you milk and whatever else you want. For as long as it pleases me. <laughs> it wasn't fair. No, it wasn't fair, but that's the folk for you. <sighs> for as long as it pleases you. But you'll have to wait your turn as a swan maiden with bibs. I don't think you'll have to worry about Snowbell. But it was honorable of you to mention it. I saw Byron. <laughs> he was in deep trouble. He was standing at the mouth of an aisle with his hair blowing around his cheeks and the wind I couldn't feel. His back was straight, his head was high, his arms were stretched out before him. Beyond him was one of those purple and green gold tusk demons with bug eyes that looked so comical in pictures. In the flesh, it wasn't comical at all. It was as beautiful and deadly as a gun. It was opening a door. Not an ordinary door, of course, a magical door, a dimensional door, a door that should not exist. I turned to catnip. But you said he was in trouble. It looks to me like he's just about to achieve his quest. Look again, said Catnip. Byron had moved a little closer to the door. He looked awfully rigid, standing there like a sleepwalker with arms out. I realized the demon was looking positively gleeful, which meant that it was doing something that made it happy, which was probably not good news for Byron. He conjured demons to open a door to the outside, said Catnip. He neglected to specify... Which outside eh, he wanted to go to. As was once said, you failed to specify when or where. Hmm. Oh, my. I took a step toward him to pull him back, and I fell over catnip, suddenly blocking my way. Touch him, and you go with him. Okay, what do I do? To rescue him? Of course to rescue him, catnip! The boy has broken a number of important prohibitions. He has entered the stacks, he's created in disturbance, and he's defaced books. He has sought to go outside. Listen, I don't care what he's done. He doesn't deserve to go anywhere wherever that damn demon's taking, mm, taking him. I've already said I'll be your servant for as long as you want, which is way longer than the usual arrangement. Help me out here, please, Catnip. So I started, <laughs> I started out heroic, and I ended up pathetic. I'm only human, okay? And I was pretty upset. Catnip wasn't. It sat down with its tail coiled around its front feet. You must break the bond between him and the demon. Once his concentration is broken, the demon will disappear, the door will close, provided it is no more than halfway open. Oh, by this time, Byron was about a third of the way down the row. The door looked to be about 33.2 degrees open, I'd say. Swirls of darkness were leaping from the gap and flashes of colors I didn't recognize. Byron, it's me, Neef, come back. Mm, nothing happened, except for the deem, demon's grin creeping around under his ears. He can't hear you, kind of remarked. May I suggest a good book? It took every bit of self-control I had not to lose it. <clears throat> but I know how these things work. This was a hint. I needed to keep my cool to figure it out. A good book could mean several things. 
I ran for the possibilities as fast as I could. With a magic book, I could turn Byron into something the demon wasn't interested in. A mouse, maybe. Or I could summon the demon, unsummon the demon. But finding the right book and the right spell would take longer than I had, even using catnip subject index. I looked at the book nearest me, The Art of Toulouse for Czech, The Architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, an illustrated folio edition of the Canterbury Tales, what they all had in common was their size. They were big books, heavy books. The door is opening, Catnip murmured. There wasn't time to think. I yanked open the grill. I grabbed the biggest, the heaviest books in both hands. I took three big steps down the aisle, and I bopped Byron on the beezer. <laughs> then several things happened at once. Byron collapsed in an untidy heap on the floor. The demon's grin disappeared into a roar that revealed more than I wanted to see of its crimson throat and knobbly blue tongue. Ugh. The invisible door slipped from the demon's claws with a screech even louder than its roar and snapped shut with an ear-popping rush of pressure, taking the demon with it. All that remained were a few little eddies of darkness that rippled aimlessly around on the floor until Catnip pounced on them and battered them still. Well, Catnip said, that was exciting. How's the book? I looked at the book. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, the Kelmscott edition. It had held up very well, better than Byron, who groaned and lifted a hand to his head. I knelt down beside him. I laid the book on the floor and helped him sit up. He winced, felt the back of his head tenderly. He looked a whole lot less handsome than he had. Oh, and I loved him so much that my heart hurt. Byron, it's over, baby. You're safe now. He pulled away from me. What'd you do that for? I was nearly there. The girl saved you, Catsnip said. Catnip said. The only place you nearly were was a world even more inimical to you than this one. I knew what I was doing, Byron said. You did not, Catnip said. When the catalog of the New York Public Library tells you something, you can make book. It's telling the truth. Byron squeezed his eyes shut very tight, took a deep breath and let it go. Okay. He opened his eyes. Thanks, Neve. You saved my life. I appreciate it. My heart, which had been standing still, thumped into action again. Mm, no biggie, you'd have done it for me. He smiled at me dazzlingly. Mm, thanks anyway. And you, Catnip, I owe you one. You do indeed. Mm. It wasn't Catnip's voice, and we weren't in the stacks anymore. We were in the genius's office, sitting in the library chairs, facing his desk. Catnip was on its haunches beside his wooden chair. Staring at us with unblinking eyes. I am gravely disappointed in you, the genius went on. Gravely. Between the two of you, you have broken virtually every rule in the list. And what do you have in your pocket, young lady? Now, <clears throat> there are times when it's okay to lie to the folk, and times when it isn't. Besides, I was too tired. Corn beef, corn beef and mustard on rice, sir. And what were you intending to do with it? Eat it in the bathroom where there aren't any books. I, will, I get hungry and I hate having to go all the way to the wannabe to get something to eat. Still. And you, young man, why did you enter the stacks? Byron was sitting up very straight and proud. I wanted a book, he said, looking at the genius firmly in the glasses. The pages wouldn't get it for the pages would get it for you. There weren't any pages available. That's right, there wasn't a page in the room. Catnip and Genius exchanged an inscrutable look. That's no excuse. As you know very well, you've been told the sacks are dangerous. You know what danger can mean here. You behaved foolishly. The glittering squares turned from Byron to me. As did you. With better cause, perhaps, but still foolishly. I'm afraid I must ask you both for your library cards. I fished my card out of my jeans. I was astonished that our punishment wasn't any worse, but I was even more astonished how sorry I was to be handing over my card. After the wonders I'd glimpsed, it was going to be hard to go back to soggy newspapers and torn magazine pages. But I don't need it anyway, Byron said, pulling out his own card. I know what I know. You can't take that away from me. Can I not? The genius said. His tone was mild, but the hair on the back of my neck rose. He held out his hand. We gave him the cards. Byron stood up and headed for the door. Coming, Neef? I stood up, too. I felt tired and sad. Yeah. Goodbye, Catnip. I'll miss you. Hmm. <laughs> not so fast, said the genius. I'm not done with you yet. Byron, Neef, 
you have broken the prohibitions and survived the ordeal. If I recall my folklore correctly, a boon is customary in cases of this kind. One wish each, don't you think, Catnip? One wish? <gasps> the white lion nodded. Very well. One wish it is. Byron? My jaw dropped. I could see why I'd get a boon. I mean, I rescued Byron. I banished the demon. All he'd done was get bopped over the head just in time. In this scenario, he was the helpless one. I was the hero. So why was he getting reward? Mm, I know the folk are not fair, but at least you can count on them to follow their own rules. I was just about to ask this when Byron popped up. He recovered from his shock faster than I had, and I was all bright-eyed and flushed with excitement and knowing exactly what he was going to say. I want to return outside. Very well. When you go out that door, you will be in the human reading room of the New York Public Library. A hero like you will have no difficulty in finding his way to the main entrance and onto Fifth Avenue. Good luck. Byron turned toward the door. Wait. First of all, how come he's a hero? He didn't do anything but almost get killed. And second of all, do you have any place to go out there, Byron? What are you going to do? Byron grinned. Seek my fortune. Want to come with? The genius turned toward me. Is that your wish, Neef? To go with Byron and help him seek his fortune? Ah, <sighs> You never know what you're going to be surprised by until it happens. Up until about a minute ago, I had thought that all I wanted in the world was to be with Byron and live happily after him. Have happily ever after with him in the fairy tale we'd, ending we'd earned for us with but then the hero question had come up, and Byron had opted for New York outside, and I suddenly wasn't so sure. What it boiled down to was that I knew I loved New York between. I didn't. I did not know whether I loved Byron. Oh, answer, child, answer. I'm getting bored. I swear I had no idea what I was going to say. I opened my mouth, and this is what came out. My, my wish... My wish is to have my library card back. Okay, let's go. Th what did you say? Byron's double take would have been funny if I'd been in a laughing mood. I'm not going with you, Byron. I'm staying here. I don't think the genius would have allowed me to change my mind, but I might have tried if Byron had argued with me. Instead, he nodded sadly. Good luck, Neef. I'll miss you. And then Byron gave me a hug. He turned around, squared his shoulders, and strode briskly through the door. Good riddance to bad rubbish, I'd say, said Catnip. I never liked him. <laughs> I did. I said, I sat down, and I started to cry. Oh, I hate crying. It makes my nose run, my eyes sting. It's so humiliatingly human. The folk never cry. I felt a weight on my knee, and I took my hands away from my face. Catnip had its head in my lap like a big dog It was purring. My library card was in my lap, too. Wish granted, the genius said. Now one last piece of business. We can all get back to work. I believe you have sworn service to cut in return for its help in rescuing that singularly stupid young man from the consequences of his foolhardiness. I sighed. What a bargain that was. Yes, I did. Catnip. The lion raised his chin from my leg. Mm, I think... I think that I will turn you into a librarian. Come in and talk to me about it when you've had some rest. But now, I'll take that cornbread, <laughs> that corned beef sandwich with mustard. I've always been curious about human food. I wanted to kiss it. I wanted to cry into its mane and generally carry on like, a, like the crispy critter that I was. But the genius cramped my style, so I took the sandwich out of my pocket. I unwrapped it. It was kind of smooshed. Catnip snapped it up, threw it back, licked its chop with a long pink tongue. <laughs> oh! Interesting. You shall bring me another the next time you come. I turned to the genius. Can I ask you a question? One wish, the genius said. You know what happens to mortals who are greedy with wishes. It's not a wish, genius. It's information. Oh, very well, very well. Byron is in the kind of tale in which the hero succeeds by attracting the right companions. If you had been his heroine, you would have chosen to go with him and used your superior common sense to help him in success in New York outside if the same rules obtained there. So what I get for saving Byron is to live happily ever after as a librarian? The 
genius blinked, looking momentarily very like catnip. What you get for saving Byron is the chance to be the hero in your own tale. Only time will tell what that will be. So that's it, really. In the tradition of the oldest fairy tales, Byron got his wish through someone else's help, and almost, mostly, I, I hope it turned out happily after, ever after for him. Sometimes when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I, I hope he's a street person for real, seeing fairies wherever he looks without being able to talk to them. Yeah, but mostly I'm happy enough, hanging out at the library, learning the ins and outs of the system, learning how to talk to the pages, feeding catnip, corned beef sandwiches, and reading. I'm reading a lot. Poetry, novels, plays, philosophy, history, and folklore. Mm, yes, folklore. I was right. Mortals know a lot more about love than folk can even imagine. At the solstice rave, I'll prove it, chapter and verse, <laughs> so that even Snowbell will have to admit she's beat. <sighs> in the meantime, I'm planning what boon I'll ask of Snowbell and figuring out what kind of tale I want to be in. I don't quite know what it is yet. But I'm getting there. <laughs>